Genetics part two. No bunnies in this one, I'm afraid. Sorry. There is, however, a discussion of sex linkage, pedigree analysis, and how to use pedigrees for risk analysis. Now, risk analysis tends not to show up on the MCAT, but it is great reasoning practice, which is really what the MCAT's all about. Plus, it makes doing pedigree analysis seem that much easier, so let's do it. Okay, so sex linkage. This is how the Punnett square looks. Males can give an X or a Y, and females always give an X. What this means is that you have an equal chance of having a girl or a boy. It's 50-50 for both. The most common type of question involving sex linkage is having to do with the percentage of offspring expected to have a disorder, which I'll get to in just a bit, but here's an example of that style of question using just gender. So the question, a couple plans to have two kids. What is the chance that at least one is a boy? There are a couple ways to do this question. The first way is to lay out all the possible outcomes, whether you do it in a table, as I have here, or the branching method is irrelevant. But as you can see, in three of the four outcomes, there is at least one boy. Now we need to figure out the likelihood of each outcome. Let's just look at the first row now. So there is a one-half chance for the first child to be a girl. There's also a one-half chance for the second child to be a girl. Now, these are independent events. They are unrelated. The fact that the first child was a girl has no bearing on whether the second child will be. Remember that next time you're at the roulette table. When you have independent events and you want to know the chance of both happening, you multiply each individual chance together. So a half times a half is one quarter. There is a one quarter chance both kids will be girls. And when dealing with gender or coin flips, it's really simple. Each outcome is equally likely. The chance of both beaten girls is the same as having a boy, then a girl, or a girl, then a boy, or both boys. So we can just fill in this table with one quarter for each outcome. You can see it all adds up to one, which is a good way to check your work, and the three outcomes we're interested in for the question add up to three quarters, which is our answer. If the couple has two kids, there's a 75% chance at least one will be a boy. Now for the other method, a shortcut, and this is something you can always do with probability to make it a little bit simpler or easier to understand, is to reword the question. Another way to say what is the chance that at least one child will be a boy is what is the chance that both children will be girls. This makes it nice and simple because with two kids there's only one possible outcome where both of them can be girls, so you just need to work out the probability for that which saves some time. And on the MCAT, that's always nice. Okay, now on to sex-linked mutations. The way you denote if a chromosome has the mutation is with a superscript like this. Colorblindness is probably the most common mutation used when teaching this, so that's why it's a C. Most sex-linked mutations are X-linked, and most of them are recessive as well. What this means is girls are more often carriers, while males actually express the mutation as they are hemizygous. The Y chromosome, which I'll talk about in just a bit, doesn't cancel out the X. The two chromosomes are completely different. Now, pay close attention to what questions concerning sex-linked mutations are actually asking, and clearly that goes for all MCAT questions, and it's something that really took me a while to get down. Don't just skim over it and assume you know what they're asking. Really read every single word. I mention this because when doing the sorts of problems similar to the one we just did, it's common to see what percentage of girls or what percentage of boys rather than what percentage of children. As you can see, the answers to what percentage of boys would be affected and what percentage of children would be affected would be different. One half versus a quarter. So just something to watch out for. Read every single word. Okay, here's an example of a Y-linked mutation. Y-linked mutations are super rare as the Y chromosome barely has any genes on it. It's shrunk over the years to its present state, and today all it really does is confer maleness. That's about it. It does have analogous regions on its poles though, so it can align up with the X during meiosis. Males only pass on a Y to sons, so should the father have a Y-linked mutation, all his sons would have it also, while his daughters would be unaffected. And that's sex linkage. Pedigree analysis is up next. So squares are males and circles are females. Unaffected individuals are a clear box. Affected are filled in with black. And heterozygous carriers are the half moon cookie. Heterozygotes for X-linked recessive actually have their own symbol, which is a dot inside the circle. And it will always be a circle because only females can be carriers. 
But I wouldn't expect to see this symbol on the MCAT simply because if you get a question about the mode of inheritance, that symbol would be a dead giveaway. Now, heterozygotes aren't always denoted as half white and half black. Oftentimes you see them denoted as unaffected, unaffected and it's up to you to figure out on your own whether they are a carrier. So that's one thing you can get asked about pedigrees. Probably the first thing you want to do when you analyze these are, is to determine the mode of inheritance. And the first thing you want to look for is if it's sex-linked or autosomal. This one is really easy. If only males are affected, it's sex-linked. Uh, and that's what this example is. If you see both males and, and females affected, like in this pedigree, then the mutation is autosomal. Once you've established that, you then want to determine if the mutation is dominant or recessive. Now, as I said earlier, if it's sex-linked, it's pretty much guaranteed to be X-linked recessive. But if you want to be sure, and this applies for autosomal disorders as well, just look for the expression of the mutation in different generations. If it appears in all of them, and I mean there's an affected individual in every generation, not just a carrier, then it's dominant. If it skips generations, then it's recessive. So those are the big things in pedigree analysis, which brings us to risk analysis. Basically, risk analysis is all about figuring out what chance an offspring has of expressing a disorder based off of probabilities found from family history. New parents often want to know this. If they both have a family history of a disorder but don't have it themselves, uh, like the couple in this example here, well, we'll be referring to as the husband and the wife, typically they want to know the likelihood one of their kids will be affected. So here's how you do it. First, we need to determine the mode of inheritance. As both males and females are affected, this is clearly autosomal. If you look at the husband's grandparents, you can also see that neither of them are affected, but are clearly carriers because they have an affected son, the husband's uncle, which means this mutation is recessive. It's autosomal recessive. And let's call it PKU. Uh, PKU is an autosomal recessive disorder. Now that the mode of inheritance has been established, we want to find out what is the chance that the husband is a heterozygote? What is the chance that the wife is a heterozygote? And what chance their child will be a homozygous recessive if both of them are indeed heterozygotes? Now, it sounds complicated, but it's a really easy step-by-step -step process. You just have to be meticulous about it. So to start, we're going to look at the husband's dad, this guy in red. Now, we've already established that the red guy's parents are both heterozygous carriers, as red has an affected brother. So that means the mating of Red's parents was a monohybrid cross. And from that cross, we know that there's a one-quarter chance of homozygous dominant offspring, one-quarter chance of homozygous recessive, and one-half chance of heterozygous. However, we need to ignore the homozygous recessive condition, as Red is clearly not that. He is not affected. So that leaves just three possibilities, two of which can be heterozygous, meaning that there's a two-thirds chance Red is a heterozygote with me so far? If not, just go back and listen to what I said again. Now, once we've established the chance red is heterozygous, now we can find the chance that the husband is. So when you do risk analysis, anyone who marries into the affected family is just assumed to be unaffected and not a carrier unless otherwise stated because these mutations occur so infrequently in the population. This means the husband's mother must be homozygous dominant. Now, assuming red is a heterozygote, there would be a one-half chance for the husband to be a heterozygote as well. That's straight from the test cross ratio. We're not done yet, though. It's not a one-half chance for the husband to be a carrier. It's a one-third chance. Because you have to multiply the chance for red to be a heterozygote by the chance for the husband to be. So two-thirds times a half gets you one-third. And we're done with the husband. Now let's figure out the chance for the wife to be heterozygous, which means we want to look at her mother, Orange. This side of the family is a bit easier. Given that Orange's father is affected and she isn't, this means Orange has to be a carrier, a one out of one chance. So the wife then must have a one half chance of being a heterozygote because her father, again marrying into the family, is assumed to be homozygous dominant, and crossing him with Orange yields a one half chance. I guess you technically do arrive at this by multiplying one half by one, but I assume that you would understand that. Okay.
So now we know the chances for both the husband and wife being heterozygotes. Now all that's left is to multiply those chances times the chance for their child to be homozygous recessive, which again comes straight from the monohybrid cross, one quarter. So now we have the answer. If this couple were to have a kid, he or she would have a 1 24th chance of having PKU. So that's how you do risk analysis, and that's it for genetics. Here are some questions. Pause the video while you work on them, as the answer slide will appear in about five seconds, so pause it now. And here are the answers. Pause the video if you'd like more time to review, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, just post in the comment section of this video, and I'll get back to you. So risk analysis really is a good example of your typical MCAT question. It's not hard in an absolute sense, but it forces you to reason out smaller and simpler things and connect them all together. Well, if this is true, then that must be true, and if that must be true, then this must be the answer. It's just a series of small connections. Uh, acidity, basicity, stability, and the relationship between those three things is another good example of that. And you can find a link to my acidity video right here.